Well, I told her she was good enough for a poke, then I threw hot tea in her face. What's up, YouTube? You know the drill. The fat guy and I are covering the Tennessee Titans, Mike Vrabel, the coaching staff, who the Titans have added, who they've lost. Then we go over the depth chart. We give you the Titans grade going into 2018 and let you know if you should bet the over or under on the Titans at seven and a half wins. Fat guy, the Titans won nine games last year under Mike Malarkey. What did you think of their season? Cut the malarkey. It was a decent year for the Tennessee Titans. They managed to make the playoffs at a mere 9-7. and seven. Uh, They did decent at home, weren't so hot on the road, but they won the games they needed to. They made the playoffs. So going into 2018 at head coach, it's going to be Mike Vrabel's first year. He was a linebacker for the Steelers, the Patriots, and the Chiefs. Notably, he played for Bill Belichick. After his playing days were over, he started coaching the linebackers at Ohio State under Urban Meyer. He then moved on to coach the linebackers of the Houston Texans, assisting Romeo Crennel. What do you think the expectations are for the rookie head coach, Mike Vrabel? Well, clearly this is a player's guy. And the, some of the places you just mentioned are quite notable. Linebackers at Ohio State, that's, I don't know, that's peaches and cream or peaches and herb, depending on what your taste buds are like. Also, coaching the linebackers of the Houston Texans, not a bad gig either. And when you say he's a player for the Steelers, Patriots, and Chiefs, he's really known as a player for the Patriots, most notably playing on offense of all places. The expectations for Mike Vrabel are pretty high because he's one of those young coach hires, so they're kind of hoping he's going to follow the Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan type mold and really elevate this team with a fresh outlook on football. And at offensive coordinator, they add Matt LaFleur, who spent the past three seasons having a lot of success coaching NFL quarterbacks. In 2016, he was the quarterback coach for league MVP Matt Ryan. And last year, he helped Sean McVay turn around Jared Goff and the LA Rams as the offensive coordinator. Now with the Titans in 2018, can he continue this magic with fourth-year starter Marcus Mariota? Since I'm a Francophile, I'll translate for you guys. Matt LaFleur or Matt the Flower. Marcus Mariota, you always feel he's on the cusp of greatness. He flashes it here and there, but he really is down in the doldrums for a lot of a lot of those games. Marcus Mariota, a star in college out of Oregon. Played for Chip Kelly, I believe. He was a number two pick behind Jameis Winston. I would have went with Mariota over Winston. Of course, it's easy to say now. Even though Win- Winston's maybe slightly worse than Marriott. I-, I think Marriott is better. He's a better athlete, too. And you're but- being tough on yourself. I'm going to back you up here and say both of us wanted Marriott over Winston. We were happy that he landed in Tennessee. Yeah, I just think he's got a lot of potential, and he's a he's a better teammate. I mean, he's a designated driver for the old linemen when they get drunk at National Predator games. Marietta has a chance to be the real deal. Obviously, they've exercised his fifth-year option. So they got two years to see what they really, really got before they have to extend him. I think Marietta is in line for a high-line year, especially with the weapons that have been placed around him. Now, even though Vrabel's a rookie head coach, his offensive defensive coordinators have had a lot of success. That includes Dean Pease, the defensive coordinator, who spent the past eight seasons with the Ravens, acting as their defensive coordinator for the past six years. With the combination of a clock-controlling, efficient offense and a Dean Pease-led defense to create turnovers, could this be the type of change that could make the Titans a serious contender for the Super Bowl? That was a good monologue. It's as if you're reading it right off a computer screen. Yeah, Dean Pease and Matt LaFleur, what a good way to support a rookie head coach. Now, those guys probably have a bit more football knowledge than Vrabel. I mean, it's hard to say, but they probably do. But I feel like that's the best way to ensure success. I mean, John Harbaugh was a special teams co- coordinator, and then he became a pretty successful head coach for the Baltimore Ravens. And as a defensive coordinator to help him out, they had, you know it, Dean Pease, who's now with the Tennessee Titans. So when you set up a player's coach with a strong support base, Mike Tomlin's had a lot of success, and I'm not sure he's the most football-savvy guy there is. But when you throw in guys like Dick LeBeau and Todd Haley, you're really going to turn the corner. So I think this is a good way to support your head coach. Have a young, fresh outlook, a guy who relates to the players, because a lot of the old school tactics don't relate with the players. So you get young at the head coaching position, but someone who's organized and respectable. And, and Mike Rabel, of all players, you'd, you'd respect his playing career first. He's also had to go through shoots and ladders to, to make his way up to head coach. 
So he did, will have the ire of the players, but he'll also have the, let's say, strategical philosophies of the offensive and defensive coordinators in the ones they selected for the Tennessee Titans. Let's go over players they've added this offseason, and we'll start at quarterback at backup Blaine Gabbert. Well, let's just hope Blaine Gabbert doesn't have to play. He's got a good head of hair, though. At running back, they had Deion Lewis. Now, Deion Lewis, he was in Philadelphia and Cleveland before he went to New England, and he's one of those guys where he always got hurt at the critical moment. He was a late-cut guy. He'd get hurt in the preseason. I believe he broke his leg for Cleveland or Philadelphia. I'm not really sure which. He got hurt on New England, but all of that is nothing compared to the production he's capable of putting on the field. But you see how small his body is. I'm sure you've seen that picture of him and Derrick Henry. If not, we're going to put it up right here. He's a small guy, and he's very quick. He's very elusive. He's excellent in the passing game. He's, he's tough to get, but if you get him, he can get hurt. He is susceptible to injuries. I hate harping on injuries, but he is susceptible to them. But with Deion Lewis, he's paired with Derrick Henry, and this seems like a really good combo considering the difference in body types and styles. Yeah, it is a nice one-two punch. The interesting thing about Deion Lewis is that even with his injuries, he's been able to stay maybe the most agile of running backs. I feel like he is. He just got really good lateral movement. I don't know if I can say the same about Derrick Henry, but at least Derrick Henry can bruise his way in any direction. That is true. At right guard, they've added a backup in Xavier Suafilo. Yeah, he was from the Houston Texans. I believe he was a second or third round pick. I think he went to Stanford. It didn't work out there, but I find it a little bit concerning when you're taking players from Houston's offensive line, which has been, I don't know, very poor the last few years. Tennessee doesn't need too too much depth i mean they're just a solid unit all the way around but uh he'll get a fresh look in tennessee and at defensive tackle they add benny logan out of philadelphia another key contributor a uh, good rotational piece but got some good snaps and they're particularly at run stuffing and at linebacker they add two exciting rookies one on the inside and rashawn evans and two on the outside harold landry so they add it with their first two picks a li- both linebackers so it's kind of a uh, it's kind of telling of the style that they want to play this might have something to do with Dean Pease and Mike Vrabel they, they want to really get after the quarterback I'd imagine so Rashawn Evans is a super athletic prospect I uh, watched some game tape of him earlier feels like he flies all over the field and I feel like that's what Tennessee is going to attempt to do this defense is quietly one of the better ones available I mean, maybe Dean Pease could make them play like the Baltimore Ravens of old. Quite possibly. I know that we've done our our fantasy defense rankings, and Tennessee is high up on our list, I believe, in the top five, maybe top six. Top five, top six. But that does have a lot of scheduling to do with it. At cornerback, they add Malcolm Butler. Malcolm Butler, he's most notably known for missing out on the Super Bowl, just this past one, for New England against Philadelphia. Sat for whatever reason that's yet to come out. Obviously, a change of scenery was needed, and he's going to get it in Tennessee. And he's going to be complimented by Logan Ryan, another former Patriot, as well as last year's first-round pick of Dory Jackson. So I feel like this could be a good fit. I'm going to call you out and say that Malcolm Butler is most known for winning the Super Bowl on the goal line. Oh, right. That interception against Seattle. Oh, how could I forget? And at safety, a recent addition is Kenny Vaccaro. And that's because of an injury to... The original starting safety, Jonathan Cyprian. Kenny Vaccaro, a former first-round pick from the Saints. Never really worked out there. He got ripped on a lot in the first couple years. Seemed to become more of a competent player as it went along. He was a a needy signing, more or less. And this safety market was, was pretty plentiful. I'm surprised I chose him when Jonathan Cyprian went down. I mean, he'd be third on my list behind Trey Boston and Eric Reed. But I still think this is a good signing. And it might even be an upgrade on Jonathan Cyprian. I don't think so, but it might be. Now, for players they've lost, let's start at quarterback with Matt Castle. Matt Castle, I mean, you're replacing it with Blaine Gabbert. But let's be honest, you're waving the white flag if you had to have played Castle or Gabbert this season. So it's not going to do much. And at running back, they lose to Marco Murray. He wasn't a puzzle piece that fit with Derrick Henry. Deion Lewis is a much better fit with, with Henry. Well, DeMarco Murray, I mean, he's most notable for leading the league in rushing, I believe, for Dallas. He, he had a much better career in Dallas, let's say. He's retired, but I'm sure you could pull him out. and Some other teams could need him. But, I mean, Derrick Henry really is the guy who's going to take the reins. The town wasn't big enough for the both of them, and they found a much better compliment in Deion Lewis. So I'm going to say this is an upgrade. And at wide receiver, they lose Eric Decker. Eric Decker? I feel like them and the Patriots are just interchangeable pieces. Uh, Patriots knocked him out of the playoffs this year 
ironically enough. So Eric Decker got released by them, and now he's a New England Patriot. I feel like Taewon Taylor is going to get a little bit more looks in the absence of Decker this year. On the D-line, they lose Sylvester Williams, Kevin Dodd, as well as Carl Klug. Sylvester Williams used to be a first-round pick for Denver. It never really worked out there. He's just a rotational piece in Tennessee, so I don't think he's going to hurt them too bad. Uh, Kevin Dodd, he's a second-round pick out of Clemson. Played in the national championship games, I believe, a pair of times. It never really worked out. I watched an interview with him just not that long ago. Seemed very dejected with the amount of playing time he's got, but you got to earn it in the NFL. And he kind of went AWOL, so they let him go. I don't know what's next for his NFL career. This might be it. And at linebacker, they lose Eric Walden. Eric Walden, an underrated player, formerly of the Indianapolis Colts. He could get there. He wasn't the greatest player there was, but he he's definitely a rotational piece. But let's not forget, they added a first and a second round linebacker. So losing Eric Walden, they've upgraded in that spot too. And at safety, they lost to Norris Searcy. Yeah, they lost to Norris Searcy, but I just said they, they had a Kenny Vaccaro. This isn't that bad. I, I, I really think they've upgraded with all the losses that they've had. All right, let's go through this roster top to bottom. Talk about the guys that are going to be playing, going to be affecting these wins this year. And at quarterback, it's Marcus Mariota or Bust. I really believe that. The flying Hawaiian, it's him or nothing. And at running back, it's going to be Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis. There's a chance that Akram Wadley uh, plays a few snaps as well, but it's really going to be a one-two punch, a very complimentary one-two punch. I mean, Derrick Henry for the straight line, the goal line, and Deion Lewis for, well, everything else. I think this is one of the better duos in the league. I actually made a bet with my friend Warren that Deion Lewis would get more all-purpose yards than Derrick Henry. And that could possibly happen. I'm not really sure now, but I, it's pretty even. I think this is an excellent combo. I'd actually find ways to get them both on the field at the same time. Because Deion Lewis is such a passing threat. And Derrick Henry, if they run a draw or something, he's just such a powerhouse going through. And Derrick Henry's got breakaway speed, oddly enough. There was a game against the Indianapolis Colts where Tennessee covered because of his breakaway speed on a uh, running the clock down play. Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis could be a match made in heaven. At wide receiver, they have Corey Davis, Taewon Taylor, Tajay Sharp, Michael Campanero, as well as Rashard Matthews. Now, Corey Davis was a first round pick wide receiver last year, and he's part of Maybe the sorriest group of first-round pick wide receivers as far as rookie seasons go. But of course, there's full optimism going ahead. But he maybe did the best. Mike Williams from the LA Chargers didn't fare so well either. He was okay, Corey Davis, but I'm not. I wasn't that blown away necessarily. Taewon Taylor, I thought, made some some decent plays last year, especially for a small little guy. Now, Tajay Sharp was a fifth-round pick from three or four years ago, and in the preseason, he was one of those fantasy buzz guys. Then you draft him, he'd have one or two good games, then he'd sit on your bench. I'm not really sure how that's going to translate necessarily. He's not the next Stefan Diggs. He's a decent player, but he's not going to, let's say, put you over the top. Now, Rashard Matthews, he's formerly of the Miami Dolphins. He's going to eat up a lot of targets. I think he might get targeted the most out of this group. And at tight end, it's Delaney Walker as well as Jonu Smith, and then blocking tight end Luke Stalker. Yeah, and when, we forgot to mention, too, we, they also lost tight end Philip Supernaw, who was more of a, a blocking tight end. Delaney Walker and Jonu Smith are going to play the most, in particular, Delaney Walker. Now, I hate to harp on fantasy necessarily, but we're getting close to that time. And Delaney Walker is a guy who I feel is going to get targeted maybe the most of any of the players on the offense for the Tennessee Titans. All right, let's go over this offensive line, which is the strength of this offense. From left to right, it's Taylor Luan, Quinton Spain, Ben Jones, Josh Klein, and right tackle Jack Conklin, who's going into the season with an injury, so there's a possibility that Dennis Kelly would step in and play snaps to start the year. I really want to see Jack Conklin on the field. I want to see this offensive line bookended by Jack Conklin, like I just mentioned, and Taylor Lewin, who I believe is now the highest paid offensive lineman. Also the best dressed. Also the best dressed. He's got that like pseudo Hitler mustache. I mean, maybe that's only a fashionable thing that Michael Jordan can pull off, but he's doing a pretty damn good job. Taylor Lewin's just a mean guy, and I like that. If you're going to have offensive linemen, you don't want pussy Jonathan Martins. You want mean badasses like Taylor Lewin, who's not afraid to bust some fingers. They had a game against Seattle last year where, I mean, they ran away with the game, but Seattle got indignant, much like they did against Jacksonville, and Taylor Lewin's one of those players that wasn't putting up with it and really messed them up. 
I like Taylor Lewin. I want to see him paired with Jack Conklin. Now, that's the strength of this offensive line, but the interior isn't so bad either. Ben Jones has had success in this league, oddly enough, from the Houston Texans, which have seemingly had weak offensive lines and couldn't let anyone go but of course they let him go of second round pick Xavier Suafilo that I mentioned earlier and Ben Jones who did play for them now at Quinton Spain at left guard I mean just a guy is a name you kind of throw around but he's a little bit better than that he fits in well with this group there's some cohesiveness among them and at right guard is just about the same in Josh Klein this line does have some fluidity to it, and it does help that Marcus Mariota is able to run with the ball, so it kind of freezes defenders in either direction a lot of the time. Not to mention when you have players like Dion Lewis out of the backfield, which are really receiving threats. So this is a pretty difficult defense to, to play around with. And Derrick Henry bruising. I mean, when, they, when you put all those pieces together, this is just a difficult unit to deal with. On offense, if they can scheme it right, they should be pretty hard to stop. And you have to think with Matt LaFleur, a guy who's had so much success over the last two years, that he can get it done. Well, I mean, I'm not saying Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis are going to match Todd Gurley's production last year, but I could see them controlling the clock really well. And when you think about it, controlling the clock is almost more important than scoring points. Because if, if you can keep your defense fresh and you can keep your offense on the field and dictating where the ball goes and just churning out time and yards, that's a better key to success. Eric Weddle said it best just yesterday. The teams that are really hard to deal with are teams that run the ball and take shots downfield because they're always on their toes. They always have to expect explosive plays, and they really just get grinded over and over. And I feel like this is the team that is built to do that. I'm not sure if they can pull it off perfectly, but maybe they can take a step in that direction. Let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. We'll start on the defensive line, and we have to highlight maybe the most underrated player in the league defensive end Jarrell Casey defensive end defensive tackle defensive lineman Jarrell Casey I mean he'll line up in a couple spots on the field but he is he is a, a good penetrator of the interior I mean that sounds you know a little suggestive at best but that's exactly what he is it's because there's, he's overshadowed by guys like Aaron Donald and before him J.J. Watt when you're always you know the fourth or fifth banana I'm not forgetting guys like Calais Campbell as well you kind of you tend to get overlooked, and defense is less of a sexy position than anywhere on the offense because of fantasy. But I'm a defensive guy. I prefer defensive football, and Jarrell Casey, I would want him on my team. And he's bookend by Daquan Jones, who's also an excellent player, and nose tackle Benny Logan, who's a space filler. They also have guys like David King, Austin Johnson, Julius Wormsley, not too much else after that. Daquan Jones and Benny Logan, this should be a, a difficult front to deal with. I think they should add a little bit more depth, but we'll see what type of UDFAs are able to pull out in the preseason. There are some surprises. There always is. So let's see if they can kind of add some depth during this uh, preseason process. And at linebacker, there's a lot to like here. They've got Derek Morgan, Brian Arakpo, as well as Harold Landry all playing on the outside. And then a combination of Wesley Woodyard and Will Compton, depending on how ready Rashawn Evans is to step in and play. They also have Jay, Jayon Brown, who played some snaps last year as a fifth-round pick. You've named some big names there. Now, Derek Morgan, I believe, has played his entire career with, with Tennessee, and he was, and he was a high-round draft pick in 2010. Savvy veteran. Yeah, Brian Arakpo was a first-round pick for Washington in 2009. Now, Wesley Woodyard is also a, a longtime veteran. He's played with Denver and Tennessee since, I believe, 2008. And then you're going to add Will Compton, who played for the Washington Redskins as well. There's a lot of veteran presence that you just named. That's going to help bring along their first-round pick, Rashawn Evans, and their second-round pick, Harold Landry. Let's move over to the secondary at cornerback. They're highlighted by Adoree Jackson and Malcolm Butler. Logan Ryan can come in and play on the inside, and then it's kind of a shit mix after that. Uh, but you've named three guys that I really like, and three guys that played a lot of snaps last year. Logan Ryan, Adore Jackson, Malcolm Butler. Adore Jackson was a first-round pick last year. He had snaps on offense. I think he averaged something like 10 yards a carry, only on like five or six carries, but it was impressive nonetheless. Uh, he was it played a little bit in special teams. He played really well last year, I felt. And you're going to add in some veteran presence in Malcolm Butler, along with who was already a mainstay in Logan Ryan. I think this is an underrated cornerback grouping, one of the better ones in the league. And at safety, Kevin Byard is a player to watch. I know he's one of your favorites. Yeah, Kevin Byard, one of my favorites. We had a little interception draft. You drafted a team, 
And the other guy drafts a team of defensive players, and whoever has the most interceptions of the year wins the money. And my first overall pick, oddly enough, was Kevin Byard. It was a snake draft, so I followed him with Tredavious White. He's one of the underrated safeties in this league. There's a lot of clout around old talent. Well, he's new talent, and you see someone to watch out for. Kevin Byard is a top-tier player in this league. They've also added Kendrick Lewis and Kenny Vaccaro to fight out that last safety spot. I hope Kenny Vaccaro wins out that last safety spot. Kendrick Lewis, all I can remember is him not being able to tackle whatsoever as a member of the Kansas City Chiefs and the Houston Texans. Yeah, he can play coverage, but he turns 15-year-old Deion Sanders when someone actually has the ball in their hands. If you can't tackle, you can't play in my books. So I'd rather go with the slow-footed Kenny Vaccaro. And Vaccaro or Lewis are going to play because of the Jonathan Cyprian injury. He tore his ACL. It's too bad. He's going to be lost for the year. Hopefully he can come back healthy next year. Fat guy, what's the strength of this roster? That's interesting. Very interesting. On offense, I'm going to have to give it to their running backs. I just think that's such a good, good combo. But at the same time, that their tackles are, are pretty top-notch. Ah, but but it, offensive line is five players. Running back is just two, and they have two stars at running back. So on offense, I'm going to have to give the tip of the hat, tip of the shades to their running backs in Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis. Now on defense, they have veteran presence on the outside of the linebacking core as well as the interior line. But I'm going to go with the uh, younger cornerback grouping. I like that three group of Logan Ryan, Malcolm Butler, and Adore Jackson. I think they're going to complement this defense well. I disagree. I think the strengths of this team, I think the heart of this team is on this offensive line. With Luan, Conklin, Spain, Jones, and Klein, they're what's going to run this team to playoff success. On the defensive side of the ball, I'm, I'm, I actually disagree as well. I think it's the linebackers. They have so much depth there between Derek Morgan, Brian Arakpo, uh, pass rusher Harold Landry. On the inside of Rashawn Evans is anything. Between him and Wesley Woodyard, it's going to be an excellent group and a tough group to go against with six, four, five, six guys that can all play. Now that just speaks to the depth of the Tennessee Titans. They're, they're pretty much deep everywhere. And you might have made a better point on some of these things. But again, you're going on optimism of some things. And I'm going to go on just what I see from last year. That being said, though, this is a very deep team, top to bottom, pretty much. I mean, nothing stands out as overly amazing, but they are good in almost every spot. This is a team to look out for, the Tennessee Titans. So the over-under going into 2018 is seven and a half wins. I was so surprised when I saw that. We have them graded out as a B-minus team, and we currently have them winning 9.38 games going into 2018. Fat guy, this is a pretty obvious over, isn't it? It is. Let's let's hammer that over. And now I'm really big into pessimism, especially when it comes to over-unders for the entire year. I mean, because injuries happen and things spiral out of control. But I'm really optimistic about Tennessee's upcoming season. It'll be new, fresh look coaching staff. You've got a lot of veteran presence coupled with athletic youth. I mean, we can't even agree on what the strength or weaknesses of this team is. So I'm going to say Tennessee is a deep team and take the over. Watch out for this team. If they didn't have to compete with Jacksonville, one of the better teams in the league, I'm pretty sure they would win most divisions. Yeah, that is a good point. They do have a very good schedule. It helps a lot. The over-under of 7.5 I think is crazy. This is an over, an easy over for us. Hit the like button if you agree with Big Ryan the Fat Guy. Give us a comment below with how many games you think the Titans will win next season. And subscribe for more NFL betting projections. Hey, did I tell you uh, I'm doing an experiment for uh, some company called Teva Pharmaceuticals?